everybody. Welcome back to Crafty Chat, episode number 11. And it definitely goes to 11 this week because we have Christopher with us, as you can see, in, Hello. in a paint splattered, undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> and always, I welcome Nancy and Lucy. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so, Christopher is a fellow uh, worker at the a Ann Arbor District Library. And I asked him to be on here today because we were working on an exhibition of zines. We can talk about what those are. And so due to certain things and closures, we're probably not having that exhibition, but we can still talk something about zines and his history with it. So what would you like to start off with, Christopher? Well, first, thanks a lot for having me. I'm really flattered to be here. Um, and uh, it's really nice to be a part of this. So I brought a bunch of zines that I sometimes use to, uh, when I was a guest at a friend's class at EMU to talk about zine design. I used to work at a magazine and we reviewed between one and 2,000 zines every issue. So I got to see a lot of really, really amazing things that people were doing with paper. Um, I saw so many creative things that it was pretty daunting um, because I didn't have a lot of time to make my own zine um, at that time, uh, but I still saved a lot of these. So um, do you want me to just launch into some of my designs that I've collected? Talk a little bit about the difference between a magazine and a zine. Sure. Folks that are listening can kind of get an idea of what the difference between the two is. Right. So really loosely defined a zine is some kind of self-published little magazine uh, which is where it gets its name it's spelled z-i-n-e so it kind of looks like zine to some people but it's a zine maybe some people have heard of a fanzine um, but zines very broadly taken are anything really self-published and Within zines, there were all kinds of topics. People would review uh, shows that they would, were going to, the punk scene, movies, personal life, comics, art, everything. Uh, it was any kind of self-expression that you would put out in a kind of semi-regular format. And uh, I've got some examples of those here. Um, mostly these are ones that really caught my eye for their design instead of just their writing. Mm -hmm. um, I like how you said semi-regular, because yeah. I remember <laughs> looking through a lot of these and people would always be publishing it and be like, I'm so sorry, you guys. I know I was supposed to have this out a month ago. And it's really funny because a lot of bloggers are like that too. They're like, oh man, I don't, didn't mean to ghost y'all. You know? It's like, yeah. but time yeah. gets away from you and it can be a lot of, a lot of time spent making those, so. It can. Uh, th so there were a lot of kind of one-offs that people had thought were going to be a long series and they would just make one and it was a lot of work and that was enough for them. And some of, you know, some of the best zines were just around for a very short amount of time. Um, yeah, it, I, I just wanted to say too that zines, I think, have really changed a lot in the last 25 years, the kind of zines that I saw and that I saw people make are a lot different from the few zines that I've seen today. A lot of zines today are quite expensive. Uh, they have a kind of more professional look and a professional distribution. They're often purposefully one shots. They kind of feel like someone's on, um, road to making it big someplace mm -hmm. and that's totally fine it's just a different approach to what I was seeing when I was really in the zine world that people were writing out of pure self-expression you were sending dollars literally you'd send a dollar bill through the post and you'd get their zine back and it was often a very intimate relationship with a zine publisher and a reader and sometimes I see people advertising zines on Twitter and they're five or $10 and it just feels different to me. 
So a lot of the zines that I first saw it when, so I first saw my first zines at art shows and like, so like art fair, um, some of the places that I would go in Detroit and even out of state in like Milwaukee and Miami, um, there'd be like street fairs where folks would have a table or even some of the protests and demonstrations that I've gone to, um, they'll have a table and it's everything from just like eight pages of copy paper folded in half and stapled with just black and white photocopies, everything on up from that all the way up to a soft cover bound book that's maybe 20, 30 pages. A lot of the stuff that I see online too, because I do follow, and I have stumbled across a lot of different zines through Tumblr and Instagram and some of the different communities that I follow, where it really is more just like a soft published book. Um, so because there's so many printing services that are available now where you can, it's much more economical than it was even five years ago to have a book published where it's just bound together as like a soft cover book. But no, all the zines that I remember were some of them were even just like four, a, a piece of copy paper that was folded into fours and it's like three pages of Great. content. And that was so cool. Um, to me, the ones that, that were just photocopied for mass distribution, and those are all always the cheapest and the most interesting to me. Right, yeah. But so, what work do you have, Christopher? I want to see some of the ones that you brought. So it's funny, I had pulled this out getting ready for our display at the library, mm -hmm. and I realized, I think it's from Jason Shiga, who visited our library a few years ago, didn't he? I'm not sure. I don't recognize the name. Okay. Um, he's got a few books out. He's a comic artist, and he does a lot of things with um, kind of choose-your-own-adventure or these kind of interesting stories of paths that you can take as a reader. So this is called The Last Supper, and it's hard to see his name right there. And this is fascinating. This is a piece of paper. And so it comes in this wadded up pile and you can go down or you can go up. Uh, I may have misfolded this. I was looking at it uh, before the, the show started and I think I got some of the folds wrong. So let's go down and it starts this story um, of a person with a P on their plate. And then we're going to go, whoops, I did misfold this. This way, and you can go up or up or down. Anyway, it's fascinating. That's really cool. And this is the kind of thing I mean when I, I say it's, you know, it's made on paper. It's just photocopied. Mm -hmm. It's so amazingly designed and you could just drop this in an envelope and sell it to someone for a buck or a postage stamp or a trade that was also really common mm -hmm. so this unfolds uh so far and it tells a story and the story branches depending on which side you flip so that's really cool he did yeah. he wrote, um meanwhile is one of his graphic novels i think that was like one of my son's favorite. I think because of, because of that, choose your own path, Right. You know, but it's really cool that you have that, that zine of his when he's right. gone on to do all these other things. So, yeah. And I didn't realize that until a few days ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was pulling these out. Um, here's a, sup a super tiny one. So you can make really small little zines and it's just a little story about two brothers. Um, so they can be in all different sizes. This one just fascinated me. I guess matches aren't really around that much anymore, but matches used to be collectible. Mm -hmm. And this was designed just like a match book uh, with an area to, to strike your match on the back. Um, we still have boxes of matchbooks my parents had when yeah. when they were like they'd collect them from bars or restaurants that they go to when they were on vacation. We had a whole drawer full of them when I was growing up, and I don't see them as much anymore. And it makes me a little sad. But right. yeah, my you know, my dad has binders of them. Like he's got plastic. <laughs> oh my god! That yeah, I mean it's like archive. that's really cool. <laughs> I don't. I I like. Uh, 
printing and souvenir type stuff, like the, the culture of souvenir making mm -hmm. and like some of the, the conventions of like what's popular throughout history is just kind of enchanting to me. But then again, I pull old postcards out of bins at antique fairs and then use them in collages. So I'm, yeah. I'm constantly picking up that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think the problem is I can't store it all, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, and it, it can really pile up. Uh, I, I, I read something once about if something is five or 10 years old, it's garbage. But if it's 20 years old, it's already culturally interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's so I've, true. Yeah, I've read that more than once. But yeah. then again, I look at how the 90s fashion is popping back up as popular again, and I'm just like, oh, God, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> A little too much of my childhood coming back. But um, mm -hmm. uh, What made you want to do the uh, zine exhibit at the library at, at downtown? Well, actually, I have about, I don't know, eight huge cardboard boxes full of zines. They're so mm -hmm. heavy. They're just packed right to the top. And I'm getting ready to donate those to um, Northwestern. I have a friend that teaches there. Oh, cool. And so I'm shipping everything to him. I've held on to these for 25 years. I've moved them so many times from house to house, state to state. And you know, I'm never going to go through them myself. It would take another lifetime to go back and catalog or reread things. It just made sense to get them in the hands of someone who would appreciate them culturally. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, I had a friend in college who got me, got me my job at the MSU library, actually, when I was in college. And she wanted to study, um, she did, she wanted to study abroad in Hamburg in, in Germany specifically to study a collection of punk zines from the 80s. Right. And that was what she wanted to do her uh, library science thesis on. She went and she did it. And then now she's a librarian. But that was just the coolest thing to me of like that. And that's what I, I, I thought was really interesting about zines is they're so niche. They're, there's a there's a, there's a niche. Sorry, is it niche or niche? I don't know. There's a niche oh. for everything. Um, and that I think we see more and more as time has gone on with scenes of like, you, you find the ones that you're attracted to or the ones that you gravitate towards. Um, but that the content is so specific and that's almost part of the magic for me because I, I like magazines and magazines are great. I just don't want to have to flip through four or five, you know, pages of advertisement to get to a article. And then it's only one article out of the whole issue that I'm even remotely going to be interested in. So like having that, the, the work of that packaging something so specific in a small, easy to consume format was like, that's social media before social media to me. Like that's, I think that's really cool. Hashtags before hashtags were a thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. They kind of were though that social media because different people like in their communities or whatever knew about the zines and sometimes, you know, they were mentioned in them and mm -hmm. there was, there was a communication that way, which is, it was really yeah. interesting to see too. Yeah. 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 So I've, I've got you? just a few others. Um, this one has always made me laugh. It's called snacks and it came with a milk bone glued on the cover and that's fallen off now, but I still have half of it. It was a collection of missing pet posters. And that's the, the entire zine was just Aww. missing pets. That's so awesome. That's so cool. And it's just <laughs> such an odd idea. And just, it was kind of funny and touching to read. Um, and then uh, I wanted to show this one too. I, I just love this design. It's in the, the uh, it's designed like a business reply envelope. And it, it just made me laugh to see that. That's cool. Um, I like things that are designed as other things. Right. That, that masquerading thing I think is, is, is a fun 
thing. But that's one of the cool things. Uh, some of the zines that I've picked up have been an equal contribution of writing and art. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's kind of the thing of like some of them are more one than the other and some of them are, you know, a good mixing of the two. But I love that art, that space for art in zines. And yeah. that like really individual form of self-expression that's artistic in that way that's then mass produced. So it's... I don't know. I have, I have some other hangups about mass produced art. That's like actually mass produced, like, you know, modern stuff like Warhol or um, Matisse or stuff like that that's turned into posters, but like that form, that single form of self-expression on a smaller scale, I always found really enchanting and kind of magical. So, and there's so much cool collage art in zines that I've seen. And that's something I've never been able to really get a handle on of being good at is collage art. Um, So I, I love that. And I think that's really cool. I, I see a lot of art on Twitter mm-hmm. and I'm endlessly fascinated that someone approaches the world in a particular unique way. It's, mm-hmm. it makes me really happy actually that there's a different way of looking at the world and expressing yourself yeah. and it never ends. I mean, sometimes you see similarities or patterns, but, I don't know. It's it's really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, do do you all look at art on social media or at, at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I um. Oh God, I'm gonna date myself here. Um, I was really active on the internet in the heyday of deviant art. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like, it's an art website that had its its big heyday from like 2000 and seven to 2006 to maybe like 2014 was really its big heyday um or at least it was for me um so I, that was where I was getting a lot of my art from but I'm also um uh, I also see a lot of stuff on tumblr that I'm on um the biggest ones that I'm seeing a lot for right now are fan art for critical role which is a D campaign that's streamed uh through twitch tv and a lot of the, the community around that show is very artistic and very creative and the players themselves feature, make a point of featuring a lot of the fan art that's been created by their fans um, of these characters, uh, which is really, really cool. And I followed for a long time looking for fan art for like Harry Potter. Um, oh my God, I'm going to blank now on a bunch of them. So like young adult books that I would be reading TV shows, um, Oh my God, Tumblr around the time of like 2012 to 2016 with Supernatural fandom stuff. (laughs) So like the show Supernatural was just crazy rampant. Um, So a lot of the art that I consume is is fan art based or like cosplay images and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, two things that I'm thinking of that I tend to kind of dip into every now and then is that website, This Is Colossal, I think is what it is. Hmm. And then there's my modern net, my modern net. I think it might be. I don't know. A lot of times these things just like pop through my Facebook feed, honestly, and then I just go mm-hmm. into there. But like they just they showcase a lot of different artists and mm-hmm. like there was a crocheted sea urchin thing, and they were like huge sea urchins. And I think that was in Japan because it was kind of like a thing to bring attention to the plight of the sea urchin. Um, So anyway, that's something I was thinking of recently. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. My modern Met is one that I do too. I mean, I check out. Mm -hmm. Um, My modern Met, I think, right? Yeah. 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 The Met Museum. Um, Yeah. I see a lot of more of what's currently on my social media is a lot of stuff that's embroidery art. Mm -hmm. Um, I follow the Royal School of Needlework and that runs out of Hampton Court in England and um, them and some of their former students that are now instructors. And then I follow a couple tags that are specifically like embroidered art. Um, there's one artist in particular, um, she's known as Hannah Cadote on Instagram, um, but she does a lot of uh, cultural and political type embroideries that are really, she has a very distinctive style and it's really, really cool. Um, I love her artwork and she's starting to put out more pieces uh, right now, which is really, really awesome to see. So yeah, and Instagram's always great. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Especially I get a lot of crafty kind of um, information coming through there, even if it's just things that then inspire me to go looking further, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of pottery in my feet. Well, I mean, I sought it out, so. Yeah. Which I sometimes have mixed feelings looking at, because sometimes it gives me the longing of like, I wish I was making stuff, like that looks really cool, or it's like, God, that's something that I wanted to do, and now look, there's somebody doing it, and this, yeah. But, yeah. And I'm just observing it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of art are you finding, Chris? Right oh, uh, I see a lot of great printmakers mm -hmm. on Twitter. There's a woman named uh, Kath, it's either Catherine or Kathleen Neely. Her artwork is so beautiful. Um, and she's, she's a printmaker in, I think in Tulsa. Mm. Uh, and I, I see a lot of old and new stuff that people are posting. It, it, just, it just endlessly fascinates me mm. and just makes me happy. Um, yeah, all different styles. It's it's just wonderful. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah so uh, that kind of leads me into wondering how did you you came across like some extreme crafting, we would call it. <laughs> <laughs> One day you're like, here's an idea for a library program. <laughs> Let's that's harvest right. the milkweed. I yeah, I keep hearing about the milkweed project. I don't actually know what that is. So you were well, I think you were there for part. Of, anyways, we'll talk. I, I may not have been paying attention. <laughs> it was so bizarre that it was like. It's oh, just sorry. Becker talking his gibberish again. <laughs> so I have been. We've we have milkweed that grows every year in our yard, and I spend a lot of time with it because it's. Uh, I like monarch butterflies. And milkweed flowers are so beautiful. I, I really, really like them. And we always had them growing up as kids. And my mother would take the milkweed pods, line them with velvet, and put fake gold around the edges, and then put little figurines inside the pods and sell them. Oh my God, I think I've seen these with walnut shells. That oh, ring the bell for some walnut shells, but that sounds yeah. amazing with the milkweed pod. That sounds like, really cool. Yeah, I also it, love milkweed flowers. They smell amazing. They do. I realized that two or three years ago. I happened to stumble across it. I was like, oh my God, these smell so good. So. Right. <laughs> so, and I've always been interested in doing other things with milkweed. Um, so I got looking at the, the silk part of the the that's attached to the seed mm -hmm. and some people have made or supposedly they used to make life preservers out of that silk um okay. and then i was bugging you guys about weaving that silk into oh okay into I wool that or other yarn <laughs> and i said can't you just uh learn drop spindle and just do this <laughs> Spin this fiber, yeah. Spin this fiber. <laughs> I've never heard of, the only thing I've heard is that plant fiber is a lot harder to spin than uh, animal fibers. So, I mean, I don't know how to spin. I want to learn, but I don't know if that's the best thing for me to learn on, but I kind of would love to see that. Um, but I mean, if like people can spin yarn out of their dog and cat fur, I'm sure it's possible. Right. I'm absolutely sure it's possible. Well, but most people use milkweed when they use it at all for the fibers in the stalk. That's what I was not, thinking, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. So people are making really sturdy cords, or I guess the term is cordage. Uh, that sounds kind of goofy to me, so I just call it, it's really like rope that they're making. Yeah. Out of the fibers in just inside the stalk it's it's fascinating you know <laughs> so with all the milkweed i have growing i found some monarch butter i found some monarch caterpillars and i brought one in the house and i'm raising it and it just molted um so the caterpillar is not too mobile right now but i'll try to hold it up uh so that you can see it wow yeah there it is. So cute. <laughs> yeah, the caterpillar is really, really cute. I've been able to watch it molt twice now. That's so neat. And it's it's just fascinating. They start so small and keep molting and getting bigger. How um, big did you say he was when you found him? 
Uh, like, like less than a half an inch. Oh yeah. Like, like mean, maybe teeny, quarter of an inch. Teeny tiny. Yeah. Does it have a name? Did you name it? Yes, I was gonna say, did you name him? No, sure. which is which is curious, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> So I was just going to show a few more examples of some envelope art. Uh, oh, yeah. That sounds okay. Ooh, yeah. That's um, something I've always wanted to do is envelope art. Or yeah, like, so, I don't think about it until after I send it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's as simple as just putting art on an envelope and mailing it to someone. Mm -hmm. This I just loved. Uh, it's a map of the Czech Republic. And... The address is right here. It was sent to my brother from a friend of ours. And I, I just thought it was gorgeous. Amazing. Um, and then this, someone just put a bunch of stickers and other art all over the envelope. You know, and when you get something like that, it is so fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. I think people have forgotten really the joy of writing letters, mm -hmm. spending a long time doing it, and then you someone gets this piece of art and piece of you yeah, in the I, mail. I had a pen pal for, for many years during high school, and he always drew all over the envelopes, like decorated them, and it was just, it was such a gift to get that. Right. Yeah. And I still go back, sometimes I read them, and I'm just like, oh my god, I just remember reading it, you know, back then, and it's just, it's just hilarious. Bye. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's, I still, um, I would think that I would write more letters and send more cards and stuff through the mail with how excited I get whenever I get a piece of mail that's not, like, junk mail. That's, you know, like, actually something from someone, or, like, a package. Um, but it just... I don't know. I have all these stationary supplies and I have all these cards and stuff. And it's like, again, like I was talking, like Heidi and I were talking about last week of like, I'm afraid I'm going to screw it up. Oh. <laughs> this is really weird kind of like opposite FOMO kind of fear of messing, fear of messing up. Right. FOMO. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I made a new word. <laughs> and this one uh, someone made a collage and they stuck a bunch of stamps in the collage cool. and then did, put tape all over it to protect it. Why does that look like a post secret thing to me? Yeah, it's it kind of looks like a post secret. A post secret? Mm hmm. What's that? Oh my gosh. Okay, so Post Secret was a project that was run several years ago. It was a thing I god, I I'm gonna have to look it up now really quick while I'm talking about it. Um somebody asked for people to send them a postcard with oh. one of a secret on it anonymously to this address in in uh, California. I don't, and there have been several books that have been published with some of the, the secrets. Right. But it's supposed to be like postcard size. Hmm. Right. Um, tell your secret anonymously, stamp and mail the postcard, and then they put it in, they, they post all of them on their website. Uh, I saw some great examples of mail art and participated in some. It's a very amorphous open-ended kind of collaborative art mm. uh just like you were talking about nancy with post secrets uh it can be about anything or almost nothing mm -hmm. uh you know it could be as simple as send me a movie a movie theater ticket stub that was ripped and say what movie you watched and someone might collect them all and may take a picture at the end and send it to all the participants, or maybe not. Maybe nothing happens at the end. But it was so decentralized. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just fascinating. I, have, I was just looking for a little piece of paper advertising a mail art show that I got in the mail. And it said, send a map of your town or your house or your job or something like that. And so you could draw one piece, a one-page map, and just send it to someone. 
and that person would collect them all, maybe put them all together for a male art show and might return it or might not. And that was it. There was no fame. <laughs> it was for the pure love of this art with strangers. Yeah, it just no. reminded me, I, I've forgotten about a friend of mine uh, a few years back did some kind of project where she had people draw hearts. I think she had postcards available around like different places you could pick up the blank. Um, and I think she'd maybe drop some off at school so people could draw and color their own hearts and then mail them all back. And I think, I believe she bound them into a book at one point. So that was kind of a cool, wow. just like, like spreading love, you know, sharing your love. Yeah. Right. I love that kind of community art. And I feel like that, uh, I don't feel like I see as much of it anymore as I did when, you know, in the mid nineties when I was growing up of, uh, folks making things for the pure joy of making it and then sharing it with other people without any concept of like, Oh, this is mine. Um, mm -hmm. something you like right now, there, there are a couple things now like post secret or like male art that I see. The one big thing I see a lot now is painted rocks. Yeah. yeah. Um, like everywhere. And that's so cool. Uh, as a thing to like get kids and adults in and it's just such a cool play thing because I, I feel like within the last 10 years I love DIY culture and I love creating stuff myself and learning things but it's a lot of what I see now of the creative community is making things for yourself for the people that are directly around you rather than making things for as a community or for the community. And I could, I could be totally wrong about this. There, there are plenty of projects around where it's like a community built structure or a community garden that I would consider an art form. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as, uh, it's, it's not as pervasive now as I remember it being growing up. But I also grew up in a kind of creative family. So that may have been the difference with my experiences. But I love seeing those painted rocks. When I was in Florida, they were seashells. <laughs> so oh, nice. I picked up like three or four of them because they're so cute. Uh, but yeah, I, I love those kind of community projects. Yeah. To see, so so uh, kind of final thoughts. What have you been working on lately, Christopher? Have you been doing any special crafting uh, while you've been just, staying at home? Yeah. Well... My ambition and my intention was to do so much. I wanted to do these advanced pom-poms that I've been trying to do forever and ever and ever. <laughs> but you know, things are busy. So it's been a lot of gardening. I am putting some ideas together for a new zine that I'm excited about. Uh, so that's, that's been part of my craft. Part of my crafting, I mean. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm curious what all of you are working on. I right now I'm I'm kind of working through the stages of creating an altered book. There's a program on Creative Bug. Oh yeah, we're supposed to check in on that. Yeah. Often, our we were doing. Lucy was also doing one like a 30 day. They have the daily challenge, so there's like yeah, a different technique or something that you do. Thing. Yeah. So I've been playing with that. I haven't really been following the show because. You know, the technique that they present, it takes some time to do. And then while I'm doing that or waiting for a page to dry, I'm coming up with other ideas. So I've kind of like gone off in my own, mm -hmm. <laughs> what I want to do to this book. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've been doing mine. Yeah. My pen and ink 31 day challenge, but I definitely do more than one a day. And then I think I'll just decide what kind of designs I like doing and go back and do more of that. Um, but it's been good because I wouldn't normally get all those supplies out to do that, you know, and so it's been a good, good challenge. That's great. Yeah. I, um, two days ago, I got the most exciting news that's happened to me in about a week. I, Ikea opened back up for shopping. So I was able to go to Ikea and get my furniture. Um, so I have my bookshelf and I have my new desk and I got everything moved in. I'm still settling stuff in. Um, I put out my sewing machine today. Um, the cat was very disappointed because she likes to sleep on top of my sewing machine in its case, and she can't sleep on it anymore, so she's very sad. Um, but I'm really, really excited to start actually working on stuff again and having a designated space. So that's been magical in its own way. And then in the meantime with that, I did start 
I talked about the Find Your Fade shawl last week. Mm -hmm. And I added my second color. Yeah. Oh, the fade shows up way better on camera. It's, um, really it's a lot more subtle mm -hmm. in real life. Like, I can't visually see the, the transition. Hmm. So, like, Very those nice. lines, those lines don't show up so much to the naked eye, but they do on camera. Um, so that's been very therapeutic and nice and calm. But You're saying the primary she, things. It, it reminds me, I, I made a skirt. I can't believe yeah. I sewed a skirt. Awesome. <laughs> I had like a stretchy jersey knit. Now there's things I would do better next time. Like some of my seams aren't great, but you know, I don't, I just kind of like had a skirt that I liked and I laid it on the fabric and just kind of cut it with some seam allowance and just like, I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. I was so excited. I made awesome. a skirt. That's so, impressive. Wow. Awesome. That's really cool. That was the first skirt that I made was a full, uh, I used to belly dance in college. So <laughs> I made, a, I made a, a, a full circle skirt nice. out of like a really, really thick jersey. Um, did not know that as that skirt was hanging, the fabric would stretch because it's a knit. So I ended up with one side up here and the other side way down <laughs> here. So I had to like cut it. But um, that was my first project. It was almost as easy as that is just cut out a big circle, sew up one side and put a casing on it and you're done. So yeah. I, so I had to play with different stitches and you're supposed to have like a blunt needle I got all this I was like whatever I'm gonna work with what I got probably yeah, my exactly. thread was too heavy or I don't know I learned how to do a blind hem though that was neat nice yeah. okay. it was a, it was a fun little Saturday afternoon <laughs> yeah there is uh, as much as like I like to you know you don't need a stretch needle to to sew stretch fabric on a sewing machine it does help I wish that it didn't but it does because uh, <laughs> yeah. you don't you end up with like the fabric will stretch out and it'll look more like a ruffle than an actual seam there are a couple uh, areas where I think yeah puckered probably because of that but it, it's fine it works who's yeah. looking at my seam we're looking at my seam step up <laughs> she's not be yeah. looking at my seams you know? you made it. yeah it, I could wear it it's not going to fall apart and I'm basically <laughs> at home anyway so yeah so I got a package in the mail today from um, the Neon Tea Party. And oh. I got a bunch of different yarns. It's this, uh, Christopher, we, we watched this. Um, it's a website that she does a lot of pom-pom tutorials. So um, we had signed, like all three of us, I think, watched part of a, web, a webinar where she did like a leopard pom-pom and a floral pom-pom. Um, so I ordered some yarn from her because it's, it's this really great pom-pom yarn. And I'm very excited to get started and she sent me this cute sticker oh that thing is cool cool it's, the little note that was like thanks lucy peace love and neon yes it's, so cool. it's called neon tea party yeah yeah it's it's um it's inspiring and it just it just it's like a fun you know um fun little package to get all these bright colors and right yeah i um mine mine will be here on saturday Oh, be here two days from today. And yeah. then I ordered, uh, I bought two, I bought yarn from two different stores in the UK uh, while they were having a sale in the middle of May uh, or like early May. And I still haven't gotten them yet. And I finally had to email and be like, I'm, I haven't heard from you guys. Please tell me I didn't get lost and they should be here soon. So right. I will have more yarn sometime soon. Not that I needed it, but I wanted it. So. I know. I, I didn't need new things to make pom-poms, but I don't know. Sometimes you do. Sometimes hey, you do. man, you're, you're just leveling up your pom-pom is what's going on right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Exactly. It's a very important skill. Serious about it. Yeah. Well, cool, man. I guess uh, those, we can wrap things up now. And yeah. uh, thank you again so much, Christopher, for joining us. Um, we always love having guests every now and then. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody in the audience, for joining us. And we hope to see you next week for episode 12. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe. And don't forget to love each other. Have a great day. Bye. Play the summer game. It's starting. Yes. It's starting. <laughs>